Welcome to What Healthy Couples Know That You Don't, a podcast dedicated to helping you create the relationship you truly want. Welcome, the power of partnership, how couples can win with finances, episode 117. Today we are keeping it real with Rhoda about money and how to manage this difficult subject as a team instead of ignoring the problems or constantly fighting. I'm thrilled to have a guest today that is going to help us delve into the often complex realm of finances within relationships. Money is a powerful force that touches every aspect of our lives. And when it comes to romantic partnerships, it can be both a source of unity and at times division. I still remember one of my guys that came in and found out that there was $100,000 worth of debt from the woman he married. In this episode, we'll unravel the common challenges couples face when managing their finances and explore effective solutions to foster a harmonious financial relationship. I love that word, harmonious financial relationship. Couples today encounter a variety of financial hurdles stemming from differences in spending habits, income disparities, contrasting financial goals, or even conflicting values about money. It's essential to acknowledge that these challenges are part of the financial journey for many couples. And I like that idea of a journey. This is a process. You're going to grow together, figuring things out. And understanding how to navigate them is crucial for a successful, united financial team that works together. Honestly consider what are your strengths and weaknesses financially? How can you do better? Money is so easy to avoid and it's important to find the courage to look at the reality of your financial situation. You can make different kinds of choices and learn and grow in how to improve. Managing money means open communication to bridge the gaps in working as a team. It would totally help to have enough self-awareness to acknowledge, I know it's too easy for me to spend money and I need to work on that. Or, I know I can be frugal with money and deprive us of doing things for pleasure. Or, it's hard for me to face living on more of a budget. Try making I statements by considering your part in the problems. Always my favorite place to begin instead of the more comforting attack the other guy mode. I have often asked my individuals and couples who talk about debt, how much is the interest on each credit card? I'm astonished how many people don't have an answer. So for homework, I ask them to go home, look it up, and apply it to the amount they owe. High interest rates are facts that do not deserve to be ignored. I had a book in my waiting room many years ago called Die Broke, which I don't believe in the title particularly because no one knows when death will arrive. But what I did like was the sage advice that the two things worth spending money on were education and experiences. Stop and ask yourself, what do you think matters financially? What is worth spending money on? Secrets about debt or spending are not fair to your partner. Compromise, negotiation, and sacrifice are all skill sets that get better with practice. Examine the financial strengths and weaknesses of the family you grew up in. I went to college wearing the same ugly and it was pea soup green winter coat I'd had since eighth grade. It was my husband, future at the time, who convinced me to ask my dad for 50 bucks to buy a new coat. I still remember the new coat, cranberry with style to die for, so etched in my memory asking my dad for $50 was such a big deal power struggles can erupt around money. I remember the wife in her late 70s and she knew nothing about their finances in retirement. 
diffuse power struggles by listening to each other so that you truly understand what is hard for your partner about finances. Leave room for facing hard truths in order to reduce shame. Growing up is honestly facing difficult situations as I constantly remind my audience. To make it easier to grow up and face difficult financial situations, my guest today is Bill Nelson, a certified financial planner and a certified financial therapist, which is such a unique combination of skills. He has experience helping couples manage their finances as a team and to evaluate and prioritize financial goals. He is the founder of Pace Setter Planning LLC. He offers a free guide, the Newlywed Money Checklist, on his website, PaysetterPlanning.com. I love free things that people offer on their websites. So let's begin, Bill, with how do you get your spouse on board with making financial changes? It's a great question, Rhoda. Thanks so much for having me, first and, first and foremost. Um, so that that's the million-dollar question, I find, for not no pun intended, with the, the money piece, right? Um the easy answer that um, uh, often is one that people have, have tried before, but I'm just going to challenge your audience. Um, have you asked your spouse to make financial changes? Has that actually been communicated directly? Good, with point. Them? Good point. Excellent. Yeah. Right. Because uh, um, often like these, these sorts of issues really truly are communication issues at the end of the day. And so before we start wondering why changes aren't happening, make sure you've asked them. Now, often when people ask me that question, they have tried before and I've either gotten shut down or dismissed or things just haven't happened. And so if that's the case, um, I would invite you to try to try to just do some self-diagnosis as to where the conversations have gone wrong before, um, right? Just like you're going to a doctor, right? Doctors don't just pull out the prescription pad as soon as you get in the door and just start writing prescriptions about how to fix things. Uh, they go through a diagnosis process, right? They look in your nose, they take your temperature, their blood pressure, all that before they start to, to write prescriptions. And you want to do the same thing here. Um, so the first thing I look at are um, how have you asked them before? What sort of tone was used, right? Because I find that often with an emotional topic like money, we drift into the four horsemen territory, which um, is the um, a, a relationship a communi communication styles that um, were first kind of coined by Dr. John Gottman that are often correlated with fair, a failure in marriages down the road. So criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling are his four horsemen. And if you have been having these conversations with those types of communication styles, that is an easy, easy way for them to, for the conversation to fall off the rails. So the first thing I would just invite you to do is take a step back and do a little bit of self-reflecting on that and course correct as you need to. And that frankly is true regardless of what you're talking about, whether it's money or something else. From there, put yourself in your, in your partner or spouse's shoes, right? Where we try to understand where things have gone wrong, right? Um, is it, has it been a problem in the way that you're asking them? Sometimes it is, right? Either you're not being clear enough, direct enough, you're not coming on strongly enough, you're coming on too strongly and pushing them away. That can happen sometimes too. Um, you're asking them at, at not the right time. If, you, if my wife asked me something after 9 p.m. on a work day, like my mind is just gone, right? No matter, no matter how important it is to me, like I'm not always going to hear what she's asking me for at that point in time. Um, right, go go through that process and just try to see if there's anything that you can tweak in your approach, or is it something on their end? Right, it, are there feelings of shame, guilt, resentment about the issues in um, about the issues related to money that we're talking about? Is there anxiety there? Um, do they have just a very different perspective and point of view that um, like the, you've had some disagreements on in the past? Right, you just you want to try to understand where the conversations have gone awry before, and then. Tailor your, tailor your approach accordingly, right? Uh, the, the easiest way to do that, I find, is to ask for something small to get the process started, right? Don't just go to go up to your partner and say, hey, let, like, you know, I want to make X, Y, Z financial changes. We need to get on a budget. We need to do this. And instead, what you might do is ask to set up some time in the next week or two um, where you can sit down and talk about something that's really important to you, which is just our overall financial trajectory or our financial goals or, or whatever it might be. I think so many people 
just entirely avoid the conversation as mm-hmm. if it's a good idea to do that you know yeah and it kind of amazes me um it, it, sex and money are mm-hmm. two of the big problems in relationships and the two things i think people talk about the least or avoid the most whichever mm-hmm. way you want to put it um i love what you said about putting your um, soul into the where the other person might be coming from so that you might be able to make that conversation a little bit easier um, and thinking about how you're approaching it and you can even begin with this is really hard for me I, I'm not exactly mm-hmm. sure how to do this in a good way but I, I really think we need to talk about it mm-hmm. you yeah. know St- starting off asking for their perspective um, yes. is always a good way to start that conversation as well yes Some of the most common financial dilemmas couples face, such as disagreements over spending, saving, and investing. How do you encourage couples to work with their differing money mindsets? I I love this one because first and foremost, the thing you need to understand is that having different money mindsets in a marriage is normal. Um, There is a growing body of research that suggests that we attract our financial opposites, right? You've heard the expression opposites attract, but it is literally true more often than not when it comes to financial issues. And in the ways that these diff- um, differences can manifest, like they can sometimes manifest in different ways. Um, oftentimes we talk about spending and saving differences where one person wants to save more and the other person's more inclined to, to spend money. But there are, there's a wide variety of ways that we can, that, that, that this can come into play, whether it's um, things with involving risk and um, security and how hands-on do you want to be with managing finances. You know, there's a lot of different ways that that can play out. Um, when it comes to money mindsets, frankly, I find most people don't have a good grasp on their own money mindsets to begin mm-hmm. with. And so when you enter a conversation trying to understand your spouse's money mindset and how it's affecting your day-to-day financial decisions, like it, it's really hard to do that effectively if you don't understand your own money mindset to begin with. And so I, I encourage couples to explore these, the, 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 this idea of money mindset together, understanding that you probably are going to have some differences and the degree to which you can understand both your own perspective and each other's, it, it can help illuminate and give some context to some of the conflict that can come up. Um, in in, in the, the financial therapy world, we have this concept called money scripts, Um, which are unconscious beliefs that we have that almost play in our heads like an actor's script would, uh, tend to be developed in childhood that guide a lot of the financial decisions that we make. Uh, They're typically incomplete or partial truths um, that are capable of being changed. Um, For example, something like people get rich by taking advantage of others, right? Mm. is, Is a statement you can make that you may completely agree with, you may completely disagree with, you and your spouse may have different perspectives on that. Um, and that can that sort of unconscious belief can drive the way you approach financial decisions. Um, another example is having more money would make me happier. Um, would be another example of a money script. And you know, to a certain degree, in some contexts, that can be true, right? If you're really struggling financially, um, I'm not one who believes that money can't buy you happiness. Now, money can buy you happiness to a degree, right? Um, but that being said, right, more more money will sol- will make me happier or solve all, all my problems isn't necessarily true, right? Money might solve a health problem that you have. Money might not solve loneliness problems if you're feeling isolated from your family for, for whatever reason. In fact, more money sometimes can make those things worse. Um, right? Understanding those types of money strips is really important because they do drive our financial decisions and our financial behavior. And so what I often encourage couples to do is just explore those types of concepts um, together, but understanding that you're each kind of doing independent work on that. And the, the goal isn't necessarily to change your spouse's money scripts, but to understand how their kind of unconscious beliefs about money are manifesting in the conversations you're having and to do work on your own more problematic money scripts that, that hold you back. That's so interesting. I've never heard anybody talk about that before. I've, you know, I've been practicing in private practice for over 40 years and did nonprofit before. I've never heard anybody talk about previous money mindsets. I think that's really interesting. Um, what strategies do you have for couples in setting joint financial goals? I often tell each partner to list five financial priorities, then explore both lists together and make a third list with some of what's important to both. 
I'm sure you can improve this. <laughs> Well, what I like about that approach is it is it forces the couple to include both people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, I I actually do something similar oftentimes um, for couples who are having a hard time coming to consensus on on financial issues because like the process of sitting down and coming up with your own answers to the question and then meeting together and combining things actually I mean it's a really good way to make sure that one spouse isn't um, completely taking over the conversation. So I, I like that. Um, you know, as far as coming up with financial goals, I think sometimes people can get tripped up around the word goals. Like they can feel a little bit more intimidating than more intimidating than they actually are. Frankly, when I talk to couples, most couples deep down want the same stuff out of their lives. Right, the the vision that you have for your future with your spouse is typically the same if you're a married couple. How we get there can be you know the answers we have to that can be very very different. Uh, but I, I find that when we actually you know, take a step back and say, what do we want our lives to look like 30, 40, 50 years from now? Like oftentimes you're going to agree on the most important things there. It, it just is a matter of taking the time to, to articulate what that vision looks like in the short term. Um, or I, I'm sorry, to, 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 you know, to take the time to articulate what that vision looks like in the long term and then understand, right, okay, where we are today, what are the short term steps we need to take? in order to make that a reality. The, the, the way I like to encourage couples to do this is before we even start talking about financial goals, come up with a, a financial mission statement for your family, mm. um, right? A, a, a couple bullet points doesn't need to be anything per particularly um, long or lengthy, right? But just something that clearly identifies what your family's most important priorities are, right? If you are um, uh, imagine you're, you're, you know, everybody listening to pick a company that you love, right? Like a company that you can't imagine the world without. And my example I always give, I grew up in Massachusetts. I like Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Um, it's a perfectly mediocre cup of coffee. There's nothing special about it, but I love it. Um, and if you're the CFO making financial decisions for Dunkin' Donuts or whatever company you choose, and your your team comes to you with a couple different investment ideas or ways that you can allocate your financial resources that all of them might look good on paper, but you you can't always do everything. So how do you prioritize? And the answer for a company's perspective is to take a step back and look at your mission statement, um, right? And, and understand what your company is best at, what your company exists to do in the first place. The um, Dunkin' Donuts mission statement. I, I don't. I don't have it memorized, but it's it's very much about efficiency, right? It's about getting you know, getting you what you need on time to get you uh, uh, you know going about your day, right? Nobody goes to Dunkin' Donuts and sits and reads reads the newspaper or works on their laptop or anything like that. Whereas their biggest competitor, Starbucks, mm -hmm. is all about the environment and and you know making a space where you can stay for hours and the, they have the music playing and like it, it's it, they're they're two companies that are very similar that have completely different mission statements and that manifests in the experience that you have there. Um, now, what does all this have to do with couples, right? Um, th the same is true for you, right? Your your goals and, and your priorities should be different from most other couples out there because your values as a family might be different as well. Uh, but it, it's hard to know what those goals should be. It's, it, can, it can be hard to come to a consensus on what those goals are until we take a step back and actually take some time to articulate what our mission is, what, what we're, what we're looking to achieve deep down beyond just the finances. I remember reading that, um, I'm a boomer and that a huge percentage, like 65%, I can't remember exactly, had not saved a dime for kids for college. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, and that really surprised me. Um, and so I think, it, you know, I just think it's really interesting to think about what is important to you in mm -hmm. the future and what is it you'd want to do. Um, yeah. And we had started doing that, the state-funded college thing for our kids so mm -hmm. many years ago. Um, and it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I like love the that. mission. Yeah. yeah I, I love that example in particular because it, it's one of the clearest cases where I actually often see really strong disagreements between spouses, right? I bet that's true. Right yeah. there, um, you know, for, for people whose parents supported them through college, oftentimes like one of their really important values as a family is to provide for my kids' education, just like um, my parents did for me. 
if you paid your way through college or you, you, know, you, you worked your way through college, like oftentimes people view that as a really formative experience that was really valuable to them and they want their kids to have as well. Um, it's, a, it's a great example of that. Yeah, that's true. What helps couples to trust each other and develop full transparency in financial matters? Um, I love I love this question because my answer is a little bit um, snarky, if you will, but oh, but 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 it but it's 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 important. What helps couples trust each other and develop full transparency? Uh, being trustworthy mm-hmm. is the best way to do that, right? If you are acting trustworthy yourself, uh, that that is the best step you can take to developing trust in your marriage. Um, avoiding black and white thinking, right? Certainly goes into that as well, right? There, there's no, like I, I find couples very often fall into to attitudes, particularly about money or like, you know, th- this financial decision is completely right or completely wrong. Um, you know, having a little bit of nuance or right? trying to understand where your spouse is coming from is important, but just understanding that when it comes to finances, right, being willing to lay everything out on the table, it is really, really important for, for the future success of your marriage, right? It, it's it's one thing to decide to combine all of your accounts, right? That's something you may or may not choose to do, but but it's another to keep financial secrets. And, and just, I, I think if you can create a culture of being trustworthy in your family, right? By being completely forthcoming with your spouse and, be, and being okay with them coming to you with, bad news, right? If they, if, you know, you know, be, being open to them sharing some things with you that you might not be so excited about. Like, I think, I think that's really important. So, um, my, uh, the end of October, I interviewed, um, a world expert on trust and he taught me something about trust. And he said, you, the first building block is that you want to believe that the other person has your best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think with finances, you wanna believe that we have our best interests at heart to make our family work financially and Mm -hmm. not run into big problems. Absolutely, and that to me brings us back to this idea of the mission statement and goals, right? If we we take a step back from what's going on in our day-to-day lives and start looking at the, the life we want to build together, uh, that, that can be a really good way to to do that. I often find like, when, whenever there's conflict or whenever there's uh, disagreements or, or, or secrets or whatever it might be on the table, um, I, I like to think, you know, picture myself driving a car, if you will, right? Um, the rear view mirror is important in a car. It's an, it, it's an important tool. You want to look back from from time to time at what's what's happening, right? The stuff you see in the car, right? What's happening in the in the in the present is important, right? The dashboard and uh, all the different things. But you you want to be looking at the road ahead as much as possible. Um, it's a good idea to look back in the rearview mirror or look at the dashboard periodically when you're driving a car. If you, all you're doing when you're driving is looking in the rearview mirror, that can create problems. <laughs> I love your analogies. They're really good. How do couples resolve and prevent financial conflict besides that mission statement? At yeah, cost, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I, the, the the short answer is try to focus on the future as much as possible, right? I find that that step really does help a lot. Um, you know, first and foremost, just kind of setting the stage for, for these for these conversations, I think, is really important. Understanding that financial conflict is normal. Understanding, like I said before, that we tend to attract our financial opposites. Right? There's there's nothing wrong with you if you're fighting about money. Sometimes, uh, in fact, if you're not fighting about money at all, that to me, like sometimes more often than not, that means you're just avoiding conversations that might lead to fights about money. Um, and, and understanding that. You know, financial conflicts, if, if handled the correct way and if you're open to it, right, may actually lead you to strengthen your marriage down the road. Mm-hmm. So often when we talk about money and marriage, right, it's in the negative. It's about how money fights are one of the most common fights for, um, sources for couples and money fights can lead to divorce down the road. But the opposite is true as well, right? If you can learn how to have productive money conversations and work through financial conflicts, it can make your marriage stronger. Um, and so that, that that's an important piece as well. Um, balancing power in the conversation is a really hard one, and I think to do on your own uh, sometimes. And so, if you're if you're struggling with this, it's a good idea to bring in a, a marriage counselor or somebody to to help with this. But you know, I, you know, with money, right? Oftentimes, one spouse is making more, one spouse 
maybe has more day-to-day -day control over the, the financial accounts or logs in more to check frequently. It's very easy for power imbalances to happen in these conversations. And um, if that's true in your family, right, you need to understand like that's all okay. It's okay to make more money or less money than your spouse. It's okay to be less involved in some of the day-to-day -day financial management stuff. What's not okay is not having an equal vote at the table when it comes to making financial decisions, right? That you need to make financial decisions as a couple together to make sure that your family's plan is working for, for both of you down the road. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't feel like I answered that question about how to resolve conflict, but those are all just things to, to keep in mind as we enter the conversation, right? From there, it's a lot of, frankly, it's a lot, a lot of the stuff that you mentioned in the, the introduction that you did to this podcast, um, focusing on the underlying interests in the in the conversation rather than the individual positions. Um, credit card debt, as you mentioned at the top, is one that, that comes up a lot that causes conflict among couples, right? But the, the credit card debt itself is, is the, the position, right, that you have, right? I, I'm angry that you have credit card debt or, you know, whatever it might be. The, the position that you have is wanting to increase your fam family's financial security, right? That's and, right. And the, and the credit right. card debt is just where we're, where we're yeah. running into friction with that. And so I think that focusing on those positions that in theory people can come to an easier consensus with, I find uh, can, can really help um, separating people from the problem, right? Um, I, identifying like what, what the actual issue is here. The easiest way I, I went through a financial conflict resolution course earlier this year and the, the instructor gave us this exercise to, you know, a ma again, this, I think this is really hard to do on your own. It's much easier to, with a facilitator. But you know, if you can imagine that you're in a theater up on a balcony, right, and you're looking down at the stage and you're seeing two people have this conversation, like what are you seeing, right? What are each of the people doing? What are they saying? What are they not saying, right? As a way to separate yourselves out from the issue to try to um, understand what's really going on. Having a little bit, of, it's kind of like being the couples therapist. You have that little bit of distance. You're not, you're not invested in one person winning or the other. You're invested in looking at the two of you and how you're interacting and how to make things work better. So yeah, I like the theater analogy too. Mm -hmm. What are some red flags or warning signs that a couple may be experiencing unhealthy financial dynamics? And what steps can they take to address these issues besides what you've already shared? I don't want to act like you haven't said a lot of good stuff. <laughs> no, sure, sure. Well, well let, let's, uh, I'll give you three um, red flags that, that I find are the most common ones that, that pop up. And kind of going from least severe to most severe, if you will. Um, first and foremost are financial boundary issues, um, whether it's between you as a, as, a, as a couple, whether it's between you and your extended family or your in-laws, whether it's between you and your kids, right? What, what financial boundaries do we have in place about how we are having financial conversations with each other, right? Um, are, do you have extended family members who are relying on you for financial support in a way that may or may not be appropriate given your financial situation? Do your in-laws or do your parents want to have a little bit more hands-on management in your day-to-day -day financial decisions than might be warranted as a married couple living in a separate place? Um, are you involving kids in a finan in financial conversations or in the, the more extreme end, like, are you trying to use your kids to manipulate your spouse when it comes to money? I've seen that before too, mm -hmm. um, right? Any sort of financial boundary issues like that to me are ones where we want to pause and immediately try to get to the bottom of what's happening and get clear on what those boundaries should be, whether they just don't exist at all, whether they're too rigid, whether they're not in the right place, right? Um, the, the, that, that's one important thing to look for. Uh, the, uh, the, the second one is actually probably the most common one that I see, um, and that is what we call in the industry financial infidelity, right? Um, the act of keeping financial secrets. From I'm amazed at how many spouse. people do that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really interesting, right? There, there was a survey done. I can't remember the the school off the top of my head that did it a few years ago, and they found that 27 percent of people admitted to keeping financial secrets from their wow. spouse. But when they actually surveyed individual secretive behavior, 53 percent of people admitted to behaviors associated with financial secrecy. So, a like it's a 50 50 shot right it, whether that's happening in, in your own life and maybe more scarily only half the people who are committing like these acts of financial secrecy recognized it was a problem oh i bet that's true yeah yes. which, which is really fascinating and, and and it can vary in forms right from keeping 
secret credit cards or you know trying to hide access so you can't see what what spending is like um, hiding income or assets or bonuses giving money to your uh, other members of your family without your spouse being aware uh, gambling is a common one certainly right there's a lot of different ways that this can manifest um, and, and you know we call it financial infidelity um, I'm not I'm not an expert in this but uh, my, my from from what I have read right it often triggers the same sort of emotional response that other forms of infidelity would I bet that's true yeah in, in a relationship and so I you know obviously that's something we want to uh, try to get ahead of and have a good plan in place for how to communicate about that so that we can move forward with that sense of trustworthiness that we had um, spoken about earlier um, and then the third and, and to me most most severe, case of like a red flag type issue we're looking for is financial abuse, right? Or financial control, taking money, preventing the other spouse from like looking for work or getting to their job. Um, Really like, you know, being pretty aggressive with how we're controlling spending decisions and who has access to what money, right? The um, statistics on that are, are really bad in terms of like, you know, if there's financial abuse going on, often there's other forms of abuse going on as well. And so for that one, like I, I don't handle any, that myself at all. That's a case where we, we need to seek help from somebody who, who specializes in that. And that's a level of manipulation that mm-hmm. is more extreme than ordinary things Correct. that you had been discussing previously. Yeah. Correct. It, it, it's not great to turn to your spouse and say like, I can't believe Amazon came to the house four times this week. What were you thinking? Right. It, 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 uh, <laughs> It's another thing to cut off access from Amazon to make Amazon purchases, right? The, yeah. the, that, that's the difference there. Yeah, that's right. What advice do you have for my audience about developing a budget, the B word, mm-hmm. and to buy into the idea that it can be a good thing? And how do you budget without micromanaging? Love this one. Love this question. Love this question. I have found I, in my years as a financial planner, I've tried every budgeting software that I have ever found. And I don't really like any of them, to be honest. Um, I think sometimes like we can often just gravitate toward the tech side of things and, and financial technology in many ways has made lives better for people. I'm not convinced that for budgeting, it necessarily is. Um, Cause at the end of the day, like I don't really care how much you spend at coffee shops this month, right? Um, if you have a budget of $20 a month at coffee shops and you spend $23 this month, right? That is not a sign that you're irresponsible and you should probably just give up budgeting altogether, right? Like that, like it, I find that, but like budgeting at the transaction level like that can cause more money fights than are even wanted. Yeah, I was thinking frankly. it could make things worse. Yeah. yeah. Um, instead, what I recommend that couples do is come up with bottom line savings targets for your family, on a monthly basis. And I often will count debt payments, by the way, as part of savings because it's money that we're using to build your net worth, right? We want to pay $1,000 a month together into our savings account or pay it down on our debt, right? Have come up with that number, right, for your family. And ideally, we're basing it on some of the goals that you have. If you want to have um, money saved up for a down payment for a house in 12 months, right? You calculate how much you need, divide it by 12, and ideally, we're, we're setting that amount aside per month. If that number isn't reasonable or isn't attainable for you, then we might need to look at the goal itself and make some tweaks there, right? But the idea is that we're we're deciding together how much money we are going to save. And then we are tracking that number and only that number going forward. It gives you one thing to focus on. Um, It often takes three to six months to really get um, this right, frankly. So if, if you set that savings target and you save half of that in the first month, again, keep going, just work, you know, work on it, iterate it. If you like the only time I, I go into transaction level type details with clients of mine is when they just, they can't figure out why they're not saving as much as they think that they can. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that, 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 that's an important piece there, but having that you know, focusing on savings, first of all, rather than spending is a, is a really good glass half full way to look at it. It can make the, the tone of the conversations a little bit more optimistic. It ties them to those future goals a little bit more. At the end of the day, it's the same thing, right? After your money gets put in your bank account, it either gets saved or spent, right? We're, we're focusing on the same thing, but in a little bit of a different way and something that's just very clear to, to measure over time. Yeah, I like that. So 
Debt can be a significant stressor in a relationship. How do you get couples to handle existing and future debt as a team, especially if one person doesn't want to face it? Yeah, this is the hardest one. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and, and, and you made a difference between existing and future debt. And I love that difference because the future debt piece is a little bit easier oftentimes, mm. right? We agree, like, what role do we want debt to have in our family going forward, right? Is debt a tool that we use to accomplish particular goals? Is debt something that freaks us out and we want to avoid at any cost, right? Agreeing on that stuff going forward is usually a pretty easy conversation to have. Where it gets tough is if one or both people come into the marriage with a lot of debt or one person has racked up debt on the side in ways that we weren't communicating about in real time, as we've discussed before. Um, It's really tough. It's a really tough one to handle uh, because to a certain degree, you talked about kind of being the adult and kind of facing things head on in the, in the intro. Mm -hmm. I I find there's a little bit of that involved as well. Um, from two different angles, right? From the from the angle of the person who doesn't have as much debt or mm-hmm. doesn't have any debt, um, it, it's very easy to say, and I, I know this because I've heard it, I don't even know how many dozens of times at this point, well, it's not my debt, right? it's his debt, it's her debt. Um, I'm sure you've heard that. It uh, makes oh, me uh, laugh, yeah. 100%, mm-hmm. right? It, it happens all the time, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's understandable yeah. right, to, to a degree. Yep. Here's the analogy, you said you like my analogy, so I'm gonna give you I another do. one. Um, if you married somebody with a heart condition, just as an example, uh, you can throw your hands up in the air all you want and say, well, it's not my heart. It's not my body. It's not my problem. And that might be true today, right? That might be true tomorrow, but you can reasonably expect that your spouse's heart condition is going to affect your life in some way, right? Whether it's health complications as they get older, whether it's like the the types of physical activities or vacations or trips you can do now, right? Um, whether it's just the financial costs associated with it. Like, like the, the underlying reality is your situation, like that, that's going to affect your life. There's just no, there's no getting around that. You can then decide how you want to respond to that. And I, I, I've never had this conversation with a couple and they've said, oh, no, I actually would look at my spouse and say, well, it's not my heart. It's not my problem. Right. <laughs> In that context, it, it's pretty clear. Uh, but debt's the same way. Right. You can decide you don't want to help your spouse make payments on their debts. That, that, that is a choice that you can make. But understand that that's going to affect your life down the road, right? When you're saving for retirement and you're able to retire at 55 because you've done such a good job saving and your spouse is nowhere near retirement because you haven't been willing to work together on that, like that's going to affect your life down the yeah, road. Yeah, that's right. But you get to decide how to respond. So that, that that's the that's the tough love I have for the, the spouse without the debt. Frankly, the more common problem that I see actually is on the spouse with the debt, mm-hmm. just guilt and, and oh. feeling... Shame. Afraid to ask for help, shame, right? Like, and and I I've had cases where like that's just held couples back, right? The the feelings associated with that were were so severe that they weren't willing to ask for help from their mm-hmm. spouse, right? They wanted to handle it on their own, and it and it held their family back from the optimal financial outcomes. And so in, in that case, and frankly for both of these cases, right? Mm-hmm. Um, again, right? We're looking forward, right? What ha- what has happened in the past. Um, has happened in the past. It's the reality, right? Wherever we've ended up in the car, right, is the reality you're starting with today. You can decide how you want to drive forward, right? If you have made some financial decisions that you're not proud of in the past, that have, have or racked up the stat, or you just haven't, or you know, student loans are a case where it's not necessarily a responsibility, right, that got us to this point, but it, you know, we, we maybe haven't as handled it as proactively as we should have to get to this point. Like you get to decide going forward how to change that. And so I think the degree to which you can focus on that future attitude, right? If you're if you're committed to fixing the problem and getting rid of it, then there's nothing wrong with asking your spouse yeah, for help. That's right. If your spouse has a ton of debt and, and they're, it's very clear they're committed to fixing it down the road, right? There's nothing wrong with helping them along the way. I would agree, absolutely. So how can couples strike a balance between enjoying their present financial resources and planning for a secure future? What advice do you have for achieving this balance? I love balance. I just always mm-hmm. think that's uh, the core of wisdom is two things. And, and so I really wanted to ask that. 
I, I love it. And my, my suggestion there is first and foremost, both are important. Yeah, right? I agree. Um, you know, you, using money today, there is such a thing as saving too much money. I've seen it. I have those conversations sometimes, mm-hmm. right? Um, right. Using your money today or even just keeping money in cash for things today. Like I often find this dynamic between like what what's what we're doing in the short term versus long term when it comes to investing decisions as well. Um because that, that is another really common difference that couples have is one person's much more inclined to want to make their money work for them and kind of you know, build wealth and over time. And the other likes to see the, the number in the bank account be, be a nice number, right? Uh, both, of, both are important, right? What we're doing today with your money to, to maximize the short-term financial objectives for your family, whether it's some sort of short-term savings goal, having an emergency fund, or just living your lives the way you want to live them right now. Um, and long-term Saving right, but both of them are important. But you want to work on them in the right order, right? I think I think it is most important in the short term to make sure you have a really good financial foundation built for your family that you're spending money in a way that is sustainable for you over time. But you also want to make sure we're we're building the tower upward, right? Once we have that financial foundation built in place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To enhance financial teamwork, what are effective ways to divide financial responsibilities and manage joint accounts, establishing clear roles and responsibilities that ensures both partners contribute to their financial well-being? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great one. Um, a few different lenses to look at that question with. First and foremost is with like the money you each are actually bringing to the table. Um, if, if, both, if both spouses are working, right? And making sure that regardless of who makes what money and what the incomes are like, everybody should be contributing to something mm-hmm. for your family. I've seen cases where uh, one spouse kind of provides all the day-to-day spending money and the other spouse does all the long-term saving. Um, I've seen cases where one spouse pays the mortgage and the other spouse pays you know, X, Y, Z things. Like it... You know, if you're combining all your accounts and, and managing money together, right? It, it, it's not as easy to track that. But you you want to make sure that you, both people feel like they are contributing to the financial well being of their family. And of course, if you're a stay at home parent, like that's a huge financial contribution because as somebody with a two year old, I can tell you that kids without a stay at home parent are expensive. <laughs> kids are expensive anyway, but kids, yeah. you know, but but uh, you. Know, Daycare is worth something, right? Taking care of the house is worth, worth, worth something, definitely. Um, as far as the the financial responsibilities and managing the accounts, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, it's completely normal for one person to be willing dash interested in doing most of that or even all of that. Um, I'm okay. I'm completely okay with that. Like, I think that's a really normal financial difference for, for couples to have. I'm not big on like forcing one spouse to log into the account X number of times per month to, to do whatever. Um, but if you have that sort of financial arrangement in your family or one pers- one, where one person is doing most of the legwork, you need to make sure, first and foremost, that the, the other spouse knows where everything is and can yes. get into everything. If you if something were to ever happen to you, like you could actually like they, they could pick up what you're doing. Uh, they also need to just be aware of what's going on as well. Like, you know, you want both people to understand the state of your financial um, household, if you will. And again, I mentioned, I know I mentioned this before, right? There's a difference between delegating financial tasks, moving money from here to there, paying the credit cards, paying the bills, whatever it is, and making financial decisions. You cannot delegate making financial decisions for your family. You both need to do that together. Um Oftentimes, I find that the, the best way to get into a good rhythm with this is to sit down once a month, 10 to 20 minutes at most, right? Um, always, I always like to be in those conversations with what's going well financially yes. for you because I, whenever I had a case where I'll never forget this, I had a client who their, their income was really high, but their, their student loan debt was really, really high as well. And, and they paid off a couple hundred thousand dollars of student loans. And I, I got the email and saying that they, they paid the last balance. It was great. And we had a meeting a, a month or so later and they came to this meeting and I said, so how's it going? I'm like expecting, expecting to party a little bit that they had gotten rid of this huge student loan burden. And they immediately went to like, like, well, we're really worried about this tax thing. And, and I said, okay, we'll talk about that. We'll fix that. First and foremost, though, we're going to take a step back and talk about the good thing that happened, right? We, we, we never, we never take the time to celebrate what's going well 
financially and just doing like taking a second to do that i find can really help make these conversations easier Uh, because regardless of what your financial situation is i guarantee you if you if you really sit down and think about it for a few minutes like you can come up with a good list of things that are 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 going well for you um that just that it it's the way the way our brains are hardwired is we don't tend to focus on it unless we intentionally choose to do so. It's kind of like the parents that that tell the neighbors good things about their kids. But yes, don't exactly. Tell their kids. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> and, and, and then from there, right, once a month, you know, how did we do last month? We, you know, like I said, we're not we're not tracking individual spending transactions unless we unless we have no idea where our money is going. Instead, we're, we're tracking the, the bottom line savings target and or how much we want to pay down on our debt. If we had a goal to save a thousand dollars this month, how do we do? Right? And you know, do we hit that goal? If mm-hmm. so, then that's great. Add that to the what's going well column. If not, right, why is it? Right? Did something unexpected come up? Is our were our budget targets just completely off and we need to reset expectations? Um, you know, in understanding that. And then from there, just then taking that information and setting goals for the month ahead. Right. Last month we saved a thousand dollars. This month we have three paychecks coming in rather than two, just because of the the way the calendar falls. So our savings targets going to be, be a little bit higher this month, right? That that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So my final question: What would you like to add that we may have overlooked? Oh boy, um, we covered a lot of ground. Oh, we did. Here, <laughs> I'm we, very happy. Which is yes. great. I, you know, again, I think that. I mentioned it in passing, right? But my the reason why I like to talk about this stuff is because a nobody really talks about money in marriages, and b whenever we do, whenever we see data, it's always negative. It, it, it's always emphasizing the dangers of not being on the same financial page and like how hard it can be to get on the same financial page. Yeah, but you're what right. I've seen from from I don't even know how many couples at this point is when you're able to get on that same financial page, it. It just makes your marriage that much stronger. Yeah, I completely agree. Bill, would you please share your website and the name of your book? Absolutely. Yeah. So my, my website's paysetterplanning.com. Uh, my book that I published last year is Marriage Centered Money Get on the Same Financial Page and Achieve Your Life Goals Together. That's Marriage Centered Money. It's the exact opposite of money centered marriage. That's the way I like <laughs> to describe that to people. Um, and in marriagecenteredmoney.com, you can get the book there as well. All right. Thanks to my listeners for keeping my eight and a half year old podcast in the top 1% globally. I'm determined to keep the topics and guests of the same high quality you've come to expect. I don't make a dime doing this and I'm proud of that. Please review me on Spotify or follow me on Podchaser. Thank you for listening to what healthy couples know that you don't. If you have enjoyed the show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes and help get the word out. To learn more or connect with Rhoda, visit therapyideas.net.